Hello, uh, welcome today to uh, my experience with podcast. Um, today we are I'm with uh, Mr. Uwe Momana. Uh, he's been on the show uh, before. And uh, today we are going to discuss um, on very in uh, important topic here, uh, which he is uh, an, an expert in, and that is getting into tech. Uh, Take a role these days is so what everyone wants to get in uh, their foot on. And uh, we bring Mr. Uwe Momana, who is uh, actually an expert in that uh, field. And although he has been on the show before, but we'll give him that honor to introduce himself and um, and uh, tell us more about himself. So, uh, Mr. Uwe, you're welcome to the show today. How are you? Very good. Uh, thank you, Joe, for having me again. This is the second time yeah. coming on the <laughs> yeah, show. Thank you. Uh, a little bit about myself, like you said, everybody, I mean, in the last show, you introduced me already. I introduced myself. Uh, I can still introduce myself again. I'm a business analyst. Sometimes they call me lead business analyst. Sometimes they call me senior business analyst. doesn't matter, but the most important thing is that I'm a business analyst. The what makes the difference is that as a lead business analyst, I work with other BAs in that lead capacity where I empower them to become the best version of themselves and also to become even lead analysts. And some have moved on to become product analysts and even product owners. Mm. I My background originally was education. So from education, I transitioned into the IT world. I'm also a Scrum Master, I'm a product owner, and I'm also an associate Google engineer, cloud engineer. I seem to have a lot of leaning towards identity and access management. I've been involved in a lot of projects, and I'm also a certified business analyst. I've got the CPAP certification. So um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. I do other stuff, like I'm a creative writer, I'm a technical writer as well. If you visit my LinkedIn page, there's a lot of stuff you see about me there. So yeah, that's me. Thank you so much. Um, so before we go to the business of the day, obviously I have said a little bit of um, the first question that I wanted to ask. Um, the first time you came on the show, we we talked about your your journey in, um, in education uh, and the uh, teaching world. Uh, but today, being it that you have transitioned to, to tech and uh, and become an expert in that area as well. So, can you share your journey with us? Uh, what inspired you initially to transition from from uh, education to tech? Thank you for that, Joe. Um, what inspired me to transition is number one, because I knew that I put on my lenses of the future and I was able to look into the future and I saw that technology is the way out. Before the pandemic, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of talk about digital transformation, digital transformation, but not on a very large scale. It was pockets of discussions here and there. People didn't take it too seriously, but I was paying attention to it. And in the education world, I saw how tech was taking over a lot of things. For example, when I started teaching, we used to write on the whiteboard with a marker pen. They still do it till today, mark you. Yeah. Then from there, we moved over to the digital whiteboard, then interactive whiteboard. When the interactive whiteboard came out, it was powerful that you could actually go to the board and interact with the board. with your finger. You could write on the board, you could use a pen and write on the board. You could have your tablet in one corner of the room and project to the board and write control it from there. So the I saw the capabilities mm. and I thought within myself, this is huge. Mm. And the earlier, the sooner I got into that space, that tech space, mm. the better for me. I saw how things were moving from even the desktop to the mobile mm. app. Things were just moving at such, such a quick pace. Quick pace. 
I saw how I had a mobile phone mm. and within a few months, it transitioned from a mobile phone to a smartphone. Smartphone. A mobile phone that would be fanciful or what it could do was receive a phone call, make a phone call, send, send a text message. Send a text message, yeah. Sometimes you could send a multimedia message, MS, MMS, message, they used yeah. to call it. MMS. And basically use it as a radio sometimes, yeah? You yeah. use it as a radio yeah. to receive. So that was basically what you could do. Yeah. And then it transitioned into... To smartphone. Smartphone. Before then, you had what they call the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry. That had such a huge capability. Mm. So, so I look at all those things and I told myself, you know what? This is the place to be. The tech world. That's the place to be. Because I saw that if things were changing so rapidly, what that meant was that in the future, everything is going that way. So if I could key in myself in one area or the other, the better for me. So that's what mainly drove me into the tech world. And of course, the money as well, because... Yeah. I'm not going to pretend that there's no money there. There's some money there as well. So that's one of the things that took me there. Nice. Um, that is fabulous. Because uh, it's not even a smartphone again today, like you said. It's, it's a pocket PC. Because um, it's not only doing a job of a uh, phone again. It's, it's some of the phones today. I, I remember when I was uh, back home in Nigeria. I used to assemble computers. We okay. used to when I have when I have a computer that is maybe like two gig, I'll be jumping up that the memory is, is huge. You see? But but today I have a phone that have twelve gig. That is massive for a, for a, for a smartphone. So you could see that a computer, a whole desktop with two gig about 16 years ago, cannot even compete with iPhone today. So I think uh, <laughs> that resonates uh, it resonated very well with me. So like um, your transition, I see uh, like the next uh, Many people struggle with this transition into tech. And maybe people who are not, are coming from non-technical uh, background. What advice uh, would you uh, give uh, to them, people who are looking to make that switch? coming from maybe your own experience. Thank you, Joe. The first and most important thing is unrestrained hunger and thirst for it. When you're looking for something so bad, so bad, you want it so bad, that's the starting point. Every other thing is addition to that. It's addition. If you have that hunger, that thirst for it, there will be a way. But if you don't have that unrestrained hunger, that unrestrained thirst for it, it's difficult. Mm. Very, very difficult. Because when you have that hunger, you look for anywhere around it. And of yes. course, there are ways around it. So the first thing is to say, to look at where are you right now? What skills? Do you, you have to do what we call a skills audit. What skills do you have mm. right now? The area you want to go into, you have to be very clear. What area do you want to go into? And then what skills are required? in the area you want to go into. What skills are transferable from where you're coming from to bring it to that area? Then the gap, the skills gap that exists, mm. okay? Yeah. How can you fill up that skills gap? By taking courses, by visiting our friend YouTube, beginning to familiarize yourself with those areas, by mm. finding the right set of people that have those skill set and begin to associate with them, make friends with them, and see how they can guide you through and network with them, network events. Mm. Because when you want to be in an a, a new area, you have to associate yourself with people in that area. Start mm. talking their language. Start thinking like them. Start acting like them by seeing how they act. If possible, start the courses that can help you, free courses. Some of them you might have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. It's okay. There's nothing wrong about that. Some you may not pay for it. 
So maybe free is okay. You still take it. But the, this, the huge place like LinkedIn, like YouTube, that you can learn a lot from free courses that gives you that foundation. Then you begin to tear. You form, you are in groups that they say they want to do a project. They're looking for volunteers. You volunteer. Because everything in life is a project. Yeah. yeah. And you begin to use your skill set. You deploy your skill set. And that way you begin to build a portfolio. So when they talk about what project have you been involved in, you say, I've been on this project. I collaborated with this person, with these stakeholders, with this stakeholder to develop a solution mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's how to. So you begin to see everything as a project. Mm -hmm. Just like before we got on this call, you said you were on a meeting about your tribesmen. You were having a meeting with them. And then mm -hmm. they could give you a big fine title, like a digital director or whatever. Okay, we want to make a end of year video, for example, yeah. for our yeah. community people. That's a project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a project. So who are you going to liaise with? Who are the stakeholders? You begin to use that as a project and build a portfolio for yourself. It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah, that is nice. Um, the 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 this that brings me to one notion that that is kind of is prevalent in in the tech world today, especially here in the UK. There is this notion from non-technical people, people who, like people who are not that, who are coming from non-technical backgrounds and who have interest in moving into tech roles. Some of them have this notion and it seems like it's fueled by the people who provide these trainings and courses. They, it seems like they have this notion that getting into tech is very easy. You just take the courses, they, some of them, they advise you on how to do your CV. And they say those courses like, take our course, take our course, you move into take. It look as if those people, some of them, when they go on that courses, they, they find out that this is not actually what they were expecting. Some of them get disappointed and after doing that courses, they didn't go further to pursue that take because their expectation and what they, they meet didn't match. And they look as if that getting into take is hard, but the people who are providing those training makes it look easy. But what can you say to that effect? Well, the, the, the solution providers, the take, people, they take training providers, mm. they're doing their job. They will not mm. tell you it's difficult. That would be, that would be tantamount to their business not succeeding if they tell you it's difficult. So they will mm. tell you it's easy. They will say, look, for example, we had somebody just trained with us immediately after training, got a job of such and such an amount yes. of money, yes. got a job of 50,000 yes. pounds, got a job of 40,000 pounds, got a job of 60,000 pounds. Mm. They keep telling you, oh, mm -hmm. this one got a job, a contract job of 500 pounds today. That's okay. So they always took those best courses, those best scenarios. Mm -hmm. And there are also mm -hmm. people who went to those places and graduated. Two years after graduation, they still gotten, haven't gotten a job yet. Yes. But my response to that is this. Again, back to what I said before. It is your hunger and thirst for it that will make a way for you. If you want something so badly, you go all out for it. If you want something so badly, you will, go, you will not be discouraged. Nothing will discourage you. Instead of finding an excuse not to do it, you find a reason to do it. Mm -hmm. You will apply, okay. yeah. It doesn't mean because you come out and graduate and you apply, you will get a job straight away. No. You have to be persistent. You have to hang in there. Sometimes you may have to do 20 applications, sometimes 50, sometimes 100, sometimes 500, sometimes 1,000. Varies from people to people. But you've got to hang in there. Constantly improving yourself, constantly improving yourself, and more importantly, getting your hands dirty, looking at projects that you can get involved in so that you can start using those skills that you learn. Because if you, if you don't use those skills, you forget. You have to have the opportunity to use those skills. 
And like I said, everything is a project. So you would say, because when you go to a job interview, for example, they're going to ask you, this is the kind of person we're looking for. If it's a product owner, if it's a business analyst, if it's um, a scrum master, tell us about the project you've been involved in. You have to look for projects to talk about. And you have different domain areas, health, education, insurance, building of softwares, automotive industry, you see, sales industry, different areas, banking, financial services, property, legal. These are different domain areas. So you have to start somewhere. Yeah. So the question is, where do you start? The providers, the people who provide this training sometimes have projects that they involve you in. If you don't have a project to involve you in, you have to create a project to get involved in it. Like even the house you leave, running your house, running the house is a project. You can decide to look at the software that is going to be the best for tracking activities in the house. Mm. Maybe tracking times and activities in the house. Mm. It could be a simple project as that, that right now in your house, everybody's keeping different itinerary on what to do. You will have one itinerary. Your wife will have one itinerary. Then the children will have another board. They write their itinerary. And then it's scattered all of, like they say in Nigeria, scatter, scatter, everything scatter, scatter. So it's scattered mm. all over the place. Mm. But you want to yeah. bring it to a central hub whereby if you look at it, they can see Mr. Joe's program. They can see Mrs. Yeah. Joe's program. They can see the children's program in one dashboard, one platform. And it could be a, a simple thing like that. What are you using to write your own program? Or what are you using to write your own itinerary? What is she using? And you bring it to one central hub, because that's what we do in programs. You go to a company, Finance department have their own program. Human resources have their own program. Yeah. So the IT people now respond to this. Pro so you, the, the company is losing time. Record is not kept accurately. Yeah. So, and it takes time to pull out data and they want to bring everything into one central hub so that if you look at this platform, you can get information from finance, you can get information from logistics department, you can get information from the warehouse, you can get information from the different departments. Bringing all these things to one central location, one central system, like the ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, that's what, pro, what, that's what BA do. Business analysts, for example, will go and talk to people in finance. What is the problem you're facing? Go and talk to people in Sales team, what is the problem you're facing? Talk to people in human resources, what's the problem you're facing? Human resources will say the, pay, the problem we're facing is that anytime we onboard a new worker, we have to send an email to the IT department. IT department will have to respond. And the time we waste in going back and forth by email, but if we automate this, so if we get a new person into the company, who once we register there on the portal, everything is now automated. Email is triggered off, they send re that is what business is, that is what automation is all about. This is what project is all about. So you can create one, you're building a house, you wanna buy a house, you do one for yourself. So you begin to create process flows, you begin to think, document things, that is what we do. You don't have to be a coder, you don't need to be a dev team person. You don't have to be a software engineer. You could be a software engineer, that's your passion, that's what you wanna do, but that things you can do in the app. You can even be a UI UX designer. Those who do a mock design of what you want to build to show people how aesthetically it will look before it is built. You can be a researcher, user researcher to find out about the market. So there are a lot of things you can do in the IT space. You don't necessarily have to be a software engineer, if you see what I mean. Yeah, um, so. Uh Thank you so much for that response. So uh, following on on that, um, still on people who are um, trying to get into tech, what a role would you say that networking and the mentorship can play in the life of somebody who is trying to, to transition 
into tech. What role does what networking and mentorship? Networking and mentorship. What role can it play? Yeah. How could it help them to break even? In my village, thank you for that question, Joe. In my village, we used to have a saying that if you want to go to the market the first time, yeah, mm, mm. go with someone who has gone to the market before. Yeah. If you follow a person where they go market for the first time, you're not going to lose road. It's in pidgin English. What that means is that you follow someone who's done this thing before, he'll be like a mm. guide for you. Yeah. So that answers the question about mentorship. Because this person has been through the journey before. He can lead you and guide you. Who act like a mentor to you. Yeah. Networking is the fact that you cannot want to be a pastor and you go and hang around mechanics. You want to be around priests. You want to be around great clergymen. Yeah. Because you want to speak their language. If you want to relocate from here, here, mm, mm. here to Italy, yeah. you know that the language there is going to be Italian. You start looking for people who speak Italian language. You start downloading Italian language app on your phone to start getting yourself familiar with it. You can't want to relocate to Italy and then you can start associating with German people and start speaking learning like German language it doesn't work that way you see what I'm saying so that's the essence about networking you want to be with people who will inspire you they will tell you this is my journey they will, they'll start speaking the terms you want to hear you want to be with people in the tech or who we talk about projects the latest project we're handling what project are you handling oh, we are dealing with this project they begin to mention names and you begin to get used to those languages, you begin to speak them. They tell you, oh, we're even looking for volunteers who could work on it. Oh, I'm available to work as a volunteer. Or we're looking for entry-level people who can come in and we start training them so that when they I'm available, you need to be in that circle. You need that to circle. look at somebody, you can see who is successful in the area you want to go into and try to yes. form an alliance with the person. Alliance, yeah to tell you things, to show you, to guide you what to do. Because when you go into an area, they will tell you there are so many qualifications, qualifications you need to get. And you're sometimes stuck. What certification should I get? You don't want to have spent so much money getting all those certifications at the end of the day. You don't, it, it's, not, it's of no use to you. So the person will be able to advise you, this is what to go for, this is not what to go for. Don't worry about this one. Go for this one. So yes, the role of mentoring and net. Uh, and networking, mentorship is very crucial. I like advise anybody wanting to go into the tech space, if you can get a mentor for yourself or a coach, get it. And also network, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, although um, the next question that I wanted you to talk about is that of um, um, satisfaction. Um, I know it's not all about getting all the satisfaction in this world or maybe packing all the paperwork, but how has a certification such as this is safe and pure PM and Google Cloud certification? How can they contribute in in like in your own career? How 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 have they contributed in your career? And how important do you think this these are for someone who is maybe starting out in in, in today's tech world? Certification is good. What it does is that it stamps a bit of validation on you it's just a little bit of validation yeah to show that you have at least if nothing else you have the theoretical knowledge yes but no matter the theoretical knowledge you have if you cannot have the skill set to apply mm. on the project mm. it's almost as good as useless now i've seen a lot of people who have spent a lot on certification mm and they have not used it. My own certifications has been as a result of the fact that it was necessary I got them because I was working in one of the top banks and they were moving all their resources mm. to the cloud, Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And I was working on the identity and access management project. And what that meant was that as a senior business analyst working on the project, mm. having an a Google Cloud certification added an additional knowledge, expertise, and background to me. Mm. 
I'm not, I don't want to be an, I don't want to be a coder. I don't want to do that. It's not, it's not me. But what it did was that it, it added as an extra boost for me. So that when I'm talking about Google Cloud, I'm very competent and conversant with the mm. terminologies, with how the domain works. And when I'm gathering requirements, I know what I'm talking about. That's how it helped me. And it gave me general context and idea about moving things from on-prem to the cloud, what's involved. It may not necessarily be Google Cloud, be it mm. Amazon, be it Microsoft Azure, the, the concept is the same. So that's what it did for me. It gave me that extra boost. So I can talk confidently about, okay, because I have the domain knowledge. So when they're talking about the cloud, either you're going to consume a resource or deploy a resource, not just like a fish that you brought out of the water. Safe <laughs> is for, safe is like, it's a big framework, okay, mm. for enterprises. It's a scale mm. agile framework. It's not okay. for small organizations, safe. It's okay. for big organizations like government entities, big public organizations, things like that, who want to deploy the agile framework. But what it focuses on is the fact that the leaders themselves have to be a part of the process. So it's not just okay. the small teams. It, it is from the top mm. down. They have to be an active part of the process as opposed to the agile framework, which you can apply in an organization and the leaders don't have a clue what you're talking about. But these ones, the leaders have to be a part of, that's why it's called scaled agile. You see, the leaders have to be a part of it in order for it to be cross-functional. Every member of the organization is part of the process. Mm. Up to the last okay. team, the dev team that would actually make the solution, build the solution, because it's all about solving a problem. In IT, yeah. it's about solving problems. So, um, thank you so much for that insight. So, my uh, Denise, uh, before we 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 round up, um, as yes. as somebody who uh, who have been probably you've been in both of these areas, being a business analyst and business owner, and um, Google Cloud engineer and leader, can you what do you think sets um, cloud based roles like? All these cloud-based roles, what do you think set them apart from other tech job, and how can people who are preparing to, to maybe go into those areas, what can you tell them? How is it? Is it more um, like, like what is the future of these tech roles? Like seeing that everything is moving to cloud, everything is moving to cloud. What can you say regarding that? and people who are aspiring to get into it. It's a good thing to aspire to get into these areas. The cloud, for example, is the future. When we talk about the cloud, we're just talking about a remote location where data is stored. Yeah. That's yeah. all managed by a third party. You don't contribute anything towards it than to go and deploy your resource your or resource. consume resource over there. And the, the, it's called abstraction. So the people who own the bare metal manage the servers, manage all the infrastructure for you, depending on what service you're going for. Now, again, I go back to my foundation, your hunger and thirst for it. That's what's going to determine your success. If you're hungry for it. Now, when we talk about cloud and these things, it's about building, solving problems, building solutions. Business owners, always give you what we call a big idea of what they want to do. They say, we want to move our resources to the cloud so that we can be more efficient, so that we can scale up things, operations, when customers increase. And when mm -hmm. during downtime too, we don't want to keep paying for services when we are not using that, consuming that amount of services. So things slow down, they pay for the services they're consuming. Now, what business analysts do is to get this requirement. And after gathering this requirement, this need of the company, the business, it has to be translated into technical specification. Yeah. For the technical people to build the solution. Now, you as a business analyst, you're not going to be the one who builds the solution. If you're a business analyst, for example, you're not the one who mm -hmm. builds the solution. It's the mm -hmm. technical people 
the dev team that will build the solution. But you will work with them to translate this requirement mm. into a technical specification. Yeah, that is what you do. Now, I give an example. Like I said before, you can have a company, the finance department, the payroll, have a system, mm. yeah, that they use to manage the payroll system. You go to the HR, they have a different system they use. You go to the sales and marketing, they have different systems they use. So for one company alone, they could have about five separate systems they use to manage each department. And these are different silos, different sections of the departments or departments managing these different systems. So it, it, it becomes cumbersome, complex. So when you want information, you go to HR, give me this information they give you. Finance, give me the information about this particular worker. Sometimes the informations don't tally. Sometimes there's a disparity because, because of disparate, you know. So this company, this candidate is here, this resource is here. He joined this company mm -hmm. as a sales rep. He's moved on from being a sales rep. He's moved on to another department. Yeah. And this is not, this is not synced with all the other departments. You see, he joined yeah. as a sales rep. It's now maybe in marketing team. Mm. It's not synced, but he's, he's moved. The privileges he's had to information as a sales rep is still there, which he shouldn't have now because yeah. it's now in the yeah. marketing team. Moved so him. these are some of the issues that happen. So they say, okay, let's move everything to one system. Yeah. So they gather all the requirements from each department. Now, after gathering these requirements, it has to be translated into technical specification. And this translating into technical specification can sometimes be a little complex, but the business analyst, for example, does not do that. You work with the tech team, the IT department to translate that. Yeah. Now, the, the, uh, the IT team could say, for, let me give you a very practical example. The IT team could say, every member of this company, should use multi-factor authentication to log onto the system, or there should be a two-layered way of logging into the system. So each time you log into the system, they should send a code to you, yeah? You authenticate the code before you log in. Now, it's very secure, but imagine doing that every single time you have to log in. What do you think would happen? If every awesome. single time you have to log in, it takes more time. More time, yeah. You waste more time. So it will become a it will become a pain, even though it's secure, but it becomes a painful experience. But the IT people will be happy because they'll be they, they think that the data will be the, the, the security in the system. But the the people in the sales department or whatever can tell you this is wasting my time. Every time I have to attend to a customer, the customer has to wait for me to do two go through this long lengthy process of logging in. So the, the next thing would be, how do we solve this problem? Yeah. We can come to a compromise. We could say, okay, there should be a single sign on. But once you sign in, you've authenticated yourself the first time, you can stay signed in. But if you want to access sensitive data in the company, it has to be multiple authentication because you're going to sensitive data now. So there has to be that sort of layered authentication to so that any person on, there's no unauthorized access yeah so that's that's the way we do this do, that, that's the way we can do it so the system has to be built in such a way and the system has to be built in such a way that if a marketing manager wants to access information then it should only be the marketing manager accessing that information it shouldn't be a salesperson accessing that information that layer has to be built that level of specification has to be put in place. And sometimes you might have to bring in what they call API. Now, I know that might sound a little bit too technical now, but you see every data you have, sometimes you need to have a third party to call on the data from another place. And that has to be via an API. For example, all the, if you go to want to access the database of the DVLA, DVLA has all the 
registered cars in this country. Yeah. All of all the cars registered in England and Wales, mm. the DVL has the, that data. So if you're an insurance company, you want to insure a car. Mm. You need to have an API to, to call up the database of DVLA, okay? To bring out the data of this car that you want to insure. Mm. Is it a Corsa? Is it a Mercedes? Is it, well, once you put in the number plate, you should call up that data about this car. It will tell you this car was bought in this country or this car was imported in. It was a right-hand drive or it was a left-hand drive. It's been converted to a right-hand drive. So there's been a modification. And then you be you be able to use that data to give a quote to the customer. You, you see, yeah, these are some of the things that happen in the back end. But the good news is that if you are not a software engineer or any of those people, you don't you are not the one to do all those technical details. You only work with the IT team to write the requirements in a language that there will be that clarity, clarity. for the software engineer people to use it to build the solution okay the the, the, the phone you have the mobile phone if i ask you yeah. now do you know how it works the nitty-gritty how it works do you know it yes sir you, God, can you explain sense, how sir. everything works how, how everything works in, can you explain how when, when you go on the internet it goes to the internet can you explain it that is none of my business I cannot, when you want to go on internet, what i will just press the button and you are there. that's it that's what you want to know yeah isn't it yeah. Exactly. Uh, you have your headphones on there, isn't it? Yeah. If I were to tell you to explain to me how the sound travels to the headphone for you to hear it, can you explain it? Is it just put the wire on the thing and Ex hear the sound. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I know. So um lastly, before we wrap up for today, can you share a, a little bit of a insight on staying competitive in this uh, fast evolving tech industry and also how you can continuously advance in your career once you have landed your first role. Boris, you've, you've, answered, you've asked the question and you've given the answer as well. Staying competitive is by just continually improving yourself. Again, when we talk about tech role, like I said earlier on, there's so many areas in the tech world. Business analysis is just one of them. Product owner, product manager is one of them. SME is one of them. Product analyst is one of them. Being, you know, there are so many roles there, okay? But whichever area you choose to be the very best by staying on top of your game, by continually improving yourself, be in the right community, network, improve yourselves, you know, read news about what's going on in that department, yeah? Visit you know, websites that talk about the latest trends in your industry and mm. look at it. We gotta, you got to constantly read. Go to LinkedIn, join the right community. People post things here and there about what is the latest thing. Just keep reading. Go to YouTube, improve yourself, constantly improve yourself, and then you'll be on top of your game. But it's very hard in today's world. I can tell you this, Joe, it's very hard in today's mm -hmm. world because... Mm -hmm. There's so much information out there. Yes. So which information are you going to keep to? See, that's why for me, I narrow in a little bit because it's very wide. It's like going to the ocean to do fishing. You can mm -hmm. catch a whale. There are dolphins. There are even crabs and shrimps. All of those things are there in the ocean. So you, you should decide. Maybe I'm going to be hunting for only, let's say, maybe dolphins. Mm-hmm. Anything about whale, forget it. Not just forget it, but don't spend too much time on it. Just stay focused on dolphins. What's the latest technology to catch dolphin? What's the latest mm -hmm. way to catch dolphin? You want to stay on that. They've discovered a new way of catching dolphin faster now. Or this one, when you catch the dolphin, the dolphin does not even lose anything. You want to stay on it. They say, okay, you know the way we were catching dolphin before that one is not even as good as this one? Stay on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so lastly, um, your program, uh, Breaking Barriers, um, is there any upcoming uh, event that you have? Can you share a little bit of um, 
that with our audience. Yes. Currently, we're taking registration for the January cohort. Okay. The January 2025 cohort. This cohort will finish, okay. the current cohort, the second cohort will finish by uh, November. Yeah, very soon. November, yeah. So we are just about probably five weeks to go. But then we'll okay. take the Christmas break and January will come back. It's a program that I will, if people are still struggling with getting a clarity on what they want to do, this program mm -hmm. helps you to get a clarity. Okay. Because sometimes people, I've seen a lot of people coming to the program, they don't have a clue what they want to do. Some say they want to do this, some say they want to do that. They're all over the place. This one say, I've gotten this certification. This one say, I've gotten that certification. Mm -hmm. Where is it taking you to nowhere? But Beyond Barriers mm -hmm. helps you to get that focus, that clarity on what you mm -hmm. want to do. And a lot of people who've come on the program, they leave the program with a sense of clarity, setting clear mm -hmm. goals on what they want to achieve, and they go ahead to achieve those goals. So it breaks those barriers of, I don't know what I want to do, or you're stuck in a particular role, and you don't know mm -hmm. how to transition to the next role, then yeah. beyond barriers is for you. Some have been in a particular level for too long. They do for a promotion, mm -hmm. but they are not able to step themselves out of their comfort zone because they don't know mm -hmm. what skills it takes, or they've not improve their visibility then beyond barriers for you okay okay so um just one last question um beyond barriers uh, uh, is there any do you kind of offer something like maybe a little bit of mentorship in the process yes okay. all our clients when they come to us we look after them provide Haba and myself will provide a focus coaching mentorship program for them that leads them through from where they are to where they want to be. They form clear cut goals and we set up an accountability system for them where they hold themselves accountable and the system that they've set up also holds themselves accountable until they get to their desired goal. That's what we do okay. to help them break okay. those barriers. Okay. Very powerful. Thank you so much. Um, that will bring us to today's, to the end of today's episode, uh, edition. And uh, we want to really appreciate you, Mr. Owen, for coming on the show today. Once in a Thank while, you. we'll bring you back again here. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. So, Joe. It's said... always a pleasure coming here. All right. You wanted to say something. No, I said thank you so much, Mr. Joe, for getting me on the program too. So it's a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll catch up again. Okay. Thank you.